So, um, in the year 313, somebody established Christianity as the official, official religion of Rome, and that was Constantine. All right, Emperor Constantine. So what happens is there's a big shift, and I mean, it happens like overnight. So these Christians who have been the persecuted now are in power. They're the, they're the place to be. So if I were to tell you there's a place where you can be, where you can, you're a part of the mainstream of culture, you're where the money's going, you're where the power is, that's where you're going to find the good jobs, you're going to want to be there, right? And you're not really going to care, oh, if you have to make a pledge to a God you don't believe in, I'll just do my own thing at home to my family gods. I'm not giving that up, right? I'll you sprinkle, throw water on me, or I'll say some stuff, as long as I can you know, have a shot of being one of them bishops, get some power, right? Get some control. So all of these pagans begin flowing into the church, and they're coming in in mass, and they really outnumber the Christians, now, the Christians are still there. There's still Christians in leadership. But you have these pagans flowing in, and you have them getting greater and greater influence on the worship service. So this is where a lot of your changes come from in the Roman church. Because um, what happens is we need bigger buildings because of the splendor of God and of the church. We've got to make them bigger and taller and more beautiful and more ornate. And we need bigger, flashier services. See, prior to this, even in what was to become the Roman church, the services were very short and simple. And the, and the time of the Lord's Supper was a, a body event. So now the people leading the services, the priests, the, the leaders of the church, they begin to wear regalia because it's part of what a pagan would expect of a priest. And now, as time goes by, this is happening really fast. The, the, the priest is no longer inviting the body in or helping the body to understand the Lord's Supper and guiding them through it and encouraging them, you need to repent and confess and do this and let's have a meal. That's not happening anymore. Now, the, all, there's an altar of sacrifice. And the altar is moved up against the wall. And then... The priest becomes a person who goes and makes a sacrifice on behalf of the body, of the people, of the church, sacrificing Christ, reenacting that sacrifice of Christ. As time goes on, the presence of Christ transitions from being in the fellowship, in the, in the worship, in the Lord's Supper, in the communion of saints, and now his presence is restricted to a piece of bread and a cup of wine. That's where he is. When we make our sacrifice, we bring him in there. And we lose all of that fellowship and all of that communion with Christ and the very thing which would make us like Jesus and would help us to live the scriptures that they now have and would help us to follow Paul as he followed Christ, would help us to understand and live out the the. So the Sermon on the Mount would impart to us a hope of a future resurrection and an eternity in heaven, the warning of a future judgment, the, 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 the imminence of a personal God. There's now a wall. And things get really cold and really legal. And a lot of things begin with, well, technically, this is okay. And now the positions of the church, they begin to become positions of power awarded by kings and awarded by cardinals. There's a book called The Bad Popes. It's a fascinating read about some of the popes, especially around the end of the first millennium and then the beginning right after uh, the beginning years of the second millennium. And the book describes... Uh, a pope who was the illegitimate son of the previous pope and the mother blackmailed him into making appointing his son pope I believe that was Pope John I want to say the 10th um, pope a young and then that and that pope a 16 year old pope who would watch the young women making their pilgrimage to St. Peter's to the to the bones of St. Peter 
because we've now become a very religious, very cultic faith, having given away the riches and glory God gave us and traded them in for the promises of idolatry. And the Pope would select which women he desired to defile. And he had all heavenly power. And by the time this Pope existed, the Pope was very close to having all earthly power. Do you remember for the first, you know, those first hundreds of years, he didn't have all earthly power. There were times when there were two Popes. There was one time when there were three Popes. Arguments. And there was the Byzantine Church. And there was all of that, you know, the Eastern Church going on. So there were some divisions there. But the Roman Church, by the end of the first millennium, just shortly thereafter, a Lock down all heavenly power and all earthly power. And that's where you get into huge trouble. Because now one man controls all of you. He has the final say on everything. So the church has become this place where um, the people are locked out, really, of the presence of Christ. They've lost worship. They are no longer a worship-based people. Now, let me just say this. The Roman church did some amazing things in that time period. There were missionaries who went to, like, they went to very dangerous places. Um, there's the whole St. Patrick who is, uh, uh, and who leads the, the uh, young Walsh guy, or, Walsh or English? Maywin Socket. He was English. Who led Ireland to the Lord. And then Columba, who led Scotland to the Lord. And then you have um, missionaries going out to the Vikings and to the Germanic tribes you know, bef- during this time period. Um, so you have a lot of great things going. In fact, they'll say that the Irish saved the church in that time period. They saved the world, really. Um, there's a book that's called How the Irish Saved the World, which is also pretty cool. Um, so there were some great things going on. And the churches had some great ideas. How do we communicate truth to people who are illiterate stained glass windows we'll tell stories in the windows how do we help them remember the life of christ we'll have stations of the cross we'll have we'll have catechisms that they have to memorize we'll have call and response so all this stuff was some much of this stuff was well intended it was just executed with a strong pagan influence because the flame of frame of reference that the folks were using that were doing these things was largely pagan so you have well-intended ideas executed with pagan influence. And so you wind up with, instead of having a little number on a wall where you just walk there, there's also a statue. There's, you know, that's more than just something uh, to, to remind you of what happened at each place of Christ. So the, the people are just, overall though, they are, the priest is making the sacrifice, the people are pretty much locked out. They don't have the word of God, except for what's given to them from the pulpit when they get the when they get the uh, the. Uh... Sermon. No, it's not called the sermon. What's it called, Nate? Uh, Tyler? The mass. And they've moved it to Latin. Early on, decided that was the holy language, so most people don't even speak Latin. So they don't even know what's being said, right? Christi, I heard Christian. I think that's Jesus. I think that's Christ. I mean, they don't know. They don't know.